Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 San Antonio Book Festival. My name is Howard Bryant. I am a senior writer with ESPN.com and also the sports correspondent for National Public Radio's Weekend Edition Saturday with Scott Simon. It is my absolute pleasure to be moderating this event on on everything of sports, on uh, an incredible book that I really, really enjoy from Frank Andre, Gertie, right? But I did I just say, I said I wasn't going to use the Andre. And I you can say uh, Frank Andre, it's totally I fine. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I did. The book is <laughs> The Sports Revolution, How Texas Changed the Culture of American Athletics. We're looking at it right here. Encourage you to uh, purchase it from Nowhere Bookshop, which is on your right hand side, I think, buy book. All you need to do is click onto it. Um, we're going to do something a little different than normal and some of the book events that I do, which is we wait until there's questions at the end, but there's no reason to do that. Frank and I are going to have a great conversation. And if you have questions as we go along, I've got them. I'm at the com, so I will take all your questions and we'll just insert them into the conversation. And so, Frank, welcome. How are you doing? You know, today I'm doing good. It's often it's hard to say uh, that I'm fine uh, when I get asked that question over the last year. It's been a tough year, but uh, spring is here and there's signs of, of, of good things happening in our country, uh, you know, at least some days. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's a really difficult thing in some ways when you really work hard to work on a book project and we're in our heads and do the things that we do. And then at the same time, you recognize that all this is happening during a pandemic. So this sort of it's almost like a trick question. I mean, I'm good, but are we any of us really good? That's totally true. No, it's true. It's 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 been very hard to answer that question in a formulaic manner. It is. Yeah. Well, I love the book. Um, thank you for having me be part of this. And also thanks. We've been talking about this for the last year or so as well. I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about this project, and I'm hoping you can speak to it to um, all of our uh, attendees as well, is when I work on projects, I get so I feel like I'm getting limited when we talk about protest and we talk about revolution, we talk about this history because we're in this space so deeply. And then you realize that, you know, there's more to this American history and the growth of sports. Sports has been the, the 20th century was the sports century. No question about that. And yet sometimes we find ourselves leaning into Jackie Robinson and then we lean into Smith and Carlos and we lean into Bill Russell and we sort of forget that there's a whole lot of life beyond Ali. So one of the things that I really liked about this book was how narrow Texas is such a huge place, but you were able to narrow uh, all of these different issues about sports, business, culture into one one really, really big narrative. Was that the intention? What was the motivation going into this? That was the intention. And, and I have to say real quick, I'm so thrilled to be here with you, Howard. I mean, you're, you're a bit of model for me and inspiration for a long time, all of your books and all of your writing. So I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you. Um, and I would say that actually it's work like yours that's you know, partly inspired this book. Right. Um, insofar as, you know, you're somebody immersed in the sports world from the media standpoint, but you're able to be a historian, number one. So when you're talking about contemporary sport and society now, you have a firm grasp of the history of, you know, African-Americans in sport, race and sport, you know, at the general level. And then you have the specialist special, specialist knowledge on things like the Boston Red, so Red Sox, right? a great book you wrote years ago, Shut Out. And so this is a book that's trying to do something similar insofar as that it's trying to, it turned out to kind of be, uh, relevant to our time now, uh, you know, I, I sort of assume that, but but I didn't foresee 2020 coming. <laughs> at all. So I think, you know, I, I yes, I wanted this book to give a broader portrait of the sport industry, you know, particularly yeah. at the collegiate and professional level, right? From the business standpoint, from the social standpoint, from the standpoint of labor, there's a lot of play by play in this book because I think that one of the things that even us as critics sport forget is that what we find so interesting about it is virtuosic performance, right? That's right. everything from Vince Young's, you know, performance at the 2006 Rose Bowl to George Gervin's finger rolls that I talk about in this book to Jerry Levice's punt returns when he's competing for SMU as the first black scholarship football player in 1966. So I wanted that to be in the book, um, and I wanted to broaden the frame beyond the Ali's and the and the and the Russells and the Jim Browns and people like that, because what we're seeing in the 60s and 70s, which is the bulk of this book, 
is a broader athletic activist insurgency, right? That takes the form of, of protest, like that we associate with Smith and Carlos. But then it's happening at these other levels of, of non-compliance and, and refusal, and along with a literature that's really critiquing the sport business at the time. And it was also cross-racial. So I talk about Jack Scott. I talk about Gary Shaw, who, wrote a, who writes a really important book in 1972, Meat on the Hoof, which is a critique of Daryl Longhorn's, uh, Daryl, not Daryl Longhorn, Daryl Royal's Texas Longhorn program in the 1960s. So yes, I was trying to give a, a kind of comprehensive view of sport and the business and sport and society in the 60s and 70s into the 80s. And I wanted it to have a kind of more ground floor regional focus. And that explains the Texas focus of the book. Yeah, one of the things you and I talked about when we did a little event yesterday, when we did your pod yesterday, was one of the was the idea that race, class, and gender cannot be separated when you're undergoing a project, when you're taking on a project. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this project when you were talking about the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders was that the 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 connection between the business of the growth of sports and where women fit in this. And I thought that was I think it's one of the one of the only books that really got into the the sort of business that is we've talked a little bit about how much the cheerleader side of professional football has been exploited but if you could talk a little bit um about the choices that you decided to make like when you're making this book some things are going to stay and some things are going to go what were some of the the tougher decisions that you had to make in terms of what was going to make the book there were a lot of tough decisions every author has to face this challenge right uh, certainly every historian does so I had a number of goals for this book. I wanted it to be, you know, representative of different kinds of Texases, right? Although this book doesn't really get into high school sports, you know, it's not really following up on the classic work of uh, Buzz Bissinger's Friday Night Lights, a well-known book about high school football in West Texas in the 1980s and the TV shows and the movies, et cetera. It really is focused on Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio and Austin. Because to me, they become these, these these important sites of Texas's impact, to understand Texas's impact on national sporting culture, which is a big part yeah. of the story of this book, right? So, so there had to be some attention to the different regions, if you will, right? And San Antonio has a very particular regional story, which perhaps we can talk about later. Um, but I also wanted to represent different sports. It would have been very easy to write this just about football. Right. Texas football is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. when we talk about sport in, in Texas, we talk about Texas football and football certainly plays a role in the story. But I tried to give different sides of the football story. So you mentioned the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, you know, Dallas Cowboys franchise, as it becomes known to the America's team in the 1978. Uh, and it becomes that way because of the, the legendary players who played for them, the Roger Staubach, the Tony, uh, the Tony Dorsett, the Drew Pierces, et cetera. Right. But but also because they had a, they sort of pioneered modern sports management, right? In, 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 right? in good and bad ways. It often is exploitative ways. And the ways you could see their exploitation most clearly is when you understand their relationship to the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because the cheerleaders play an important role in the making of the cowboy brand, and they That's still right. do, right? So so certainly the story in that chapter is about certainly the ways in which these women are underpaid. Uh, and the ways in which television plays a gigantic role in the making of the Cowboy brand and of the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, including the sexism that you see in television culture, which I talk about. But I also wanted us to get a sense of who these women were. It's actually very difficult to identify who the cheerleaders were in the 1970s. You know, they're just sort of seen That's as right. a bunch of beautiful, attractive women who kicked their legs and, and got straight mm -hmm. men excited on the football field uh, or in the, on the, uh, you know, through the television. And so I want to give a sense of why these women decided to dance for the Cowboys in the 1970s. And they weren't all white. There were, you know, there was a very significant presence of black and Latinx and even Asian American cheerleaders in that story, right? So I could have, you know, I, I felt like that was the only way I could approach the Cowboy question. I had to do it through the lens of the cheerleaders. And I also, you know, really focused on women in sports through t tennis because, you know, the story of the making of the professional women's tennis tour, which we associate with Billie Jean King in the original nine, mm -hmm. is not by accident it's situated in Houston. Right. And, and it's because Houston and Texas has this dynamic entrepreneurial environment. It's because the Texas economy, you know, throughout the 20th century into the 1980s is in a perpetual upward trajectory because of the dominance of the oil industry. Right. And the energy economy. 
And so, you know, and 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 because the tech, the tennis scene was interesting uh, in Houston, and it's not by accident that first tour that's eventually sponsored by Virginia Slim's uh, tobacco money, uh, shepherded in and organized by Gladys Hellman, you know, happens in Houston. And the yeah. perfect bookend to that story happens with the Battle of the Sexes tennis match exactly. in 1923 at the Astrodome, which also plays a big role in the story. Huge part of it. And also, yes, as a to be a good moderator, I have to remind people, if you have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. And we are not going to do this at the end. We're going to do it as we keep going. So if you have any questions, there's no reason to wait till the end. I'm going to be a good point guard and pass the ball. So if you have questions now, feel free to throw them into the chat and I will ask them of Frank as we uh, as we keep talking. I'm glad that you brought up the Astrodome as well, because one of the things that I really thought was fascinating about this book was the contrast between the 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 uh, Astrodome and the arrival of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> and when you wrote that chapter about the Rangers and obviously about Ted Williams coming in and about the team leaving Washington and moving, uh, it was part of a movement, part of this, if you go from 1953 to 1969, 1970, obviously 72 when the Rangers arrived, huge, huge turnover in sports. All of the, the two team markets ended up leaving, you know, the St. Louis lost one of their teams, Boston lost one, of, Boston goes to Milwaukee, Milwaukee goes to Atlanta later on. And so the arrival of the Houston Astros as the Colt 45s, and of course you build the Astrodome, huge, huge, huge moment in the history of the building and the business of sports. And people talk about this as such. When the Rangers get here in 72, it's almost as if, I mean, you write it really, really well that the owner, the owner, former owner of the Lakers, Bob Short, talk about a perfect last name. <laughs> because he, he really did not put a whole lot into this beyond trying to make a quick dollar. And so could you tell tell us that story about the, the Rangers getting here and just how the Astros, when they came into prominence with the Astrodome in 65, it's clear that they're thinking about business. They're thinking about the future. They're thinking about the conditions of playing baseball in Texas. It doesn't seem like the Rangers were thinking about any of that. No, there's some very, very different trajectories. I'm glad you you, you put it that way. Um, so absolutely, you know, so much of the story of the what I'm calling the sports revolution. You know, you just you said earlier the 20th century is the is the century of sport, certainly in the U.S. but throughout the globe. I think that's absolutely true. And the 1960s and 70s is, is you know there's these moments of a boom. The 1920s is one with the you know with the emergence of Babe Ruth and the popularization of Major League Baseball, college football. The 1960s and 70s is another one of those moments, right? So uh, and it's because you have these entrepreneurs in places like Texas first, following, you know, following the Braves moving from Boston to Milwaukee, following the move of uh, O'Malley and Stoneham taking the Dodgers and the Giants from New York to the West Coast. And right after that, right, here comes the Houston Sports Association with Roy Hoffines and his group of oilmen businessmen who are like, we want Major League Baseball. And of course, Major League, Base Major League Baseball is like, no, we don't want any more expansions. But of course, they figure out a way to intrude upon MLB and they create you know, the Houston Colt 45s, along with the New York Mets, which came in at the same time too, right? So, and the Astros become totally identified with the Astrodome, right? Because it's the first indoor stadium, right? That's built in the United States, the first with artificial turf, the first with the luxury box, right? And it really is sets the template for understanding all subsequent stadium constructions after that. You can't understand a modern American stadium without understanding the impact of the Astrodome. The Rangers, Come to Texas because it's a money grab by Bob Short, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it provokes enormous anxiety in Washington, D.C., because it's the second time that a major league franchise leaves Washington, the first time when the Senators leave from Minnesota. There's the expansion franchise that comes in 61. Bob Short buys the team in 68 with like $900,000 or something like that. He works out some scheme. Uh, and it's clear he doesn't really want them to stay in Washington, right? And he's like, I'm going to the Sun Belt. I'm looking and for some place to go. He's looking for a place to go, and Texas is one of those places where mayors and public officials are saying, come on down, literally. And that's how they wind up in, in, in Arlington, Texas, playing in this, this shoestring, you know, minor league ballpark that, you know, Ranger fans probably remember old enough as Arlington which State. Is, which is now and, two ballparks ago. And now, now, right, that's two ballparks ago. Exactly right, right. And that's the other thing that this moment does. It ushers in this sort of stadium game that all major league franchises play. I mean, including the Rangers. They've gotten very good at it, actually, right? So, and yet somehow the Rangers make it, 
in Arlington. And you know, my argument is that it's not about far-sighted management. I think the story of successful franchises is often the genius GM, the visionary owner. You know, they play a role, but the Rangers really, to some degree, uh, it's about that somehow they wind up with this talent that comes together and really epitomizes me and Ferguson Jenkins when he comes to the Rangers in 1974. Uh, and, and and also you've got, this, you know, at this point, the integration era in Major League Baseball has happened. So you've got black players, you've got Latino players playing in places like, you know, Arlington, Texas, uh, you know, and other places like that in the Sun Belt. And it's really their talent that allowed them to compete and then draw fans eventually so that the Rangers, you know, eventually establish themselves, you know, in the North Dallas market. It's almost by accident to some degree, you know, yeah, but it's, exactly. a, it's a really interesting story precisely because of that, I think. Well, I'm glad we got into this because we had one question from Peter McGannity who was asking this very question about writing about the Colt 45s. And I wanted to go back to that just for a quick second as you contrast the Rangers and the, the Astros. It did seem like in general, you you absolutely sort of understood that there was a plan for the Astros. Yeah. And th there is a big difference between the two. One of the things that we're talking about now in terms of the the, the uh, current events, we're talking about what happened in, in Georgia right now. And in thinking about Georgia, we're also thinking about, I think one of the questions that I mentioned in a story the other day was the only reason that the Braves have a team <laughs> is because integration was a condition integration of fulton county stadium was a condition for the milwaukee braves to leave and come to atlanta so you saw the politicians mayor ivan allen in atlanta making sure that if we're going to be a major league city we can't have segregation we can't have these things and if you think about the contrast of the history of atlanta against the history of birmingham one city embraced integration and wouldn't let it go the other right. one didn't and became the powerhouse of the south what were the, some of the, the business and racial considerations that Texas had to make as we moved into the sports second half of the century, moving into the from the late 50s into the 60s and 70s? Yeah, and Houston is the best place to see this, I think, you know, along with Atlanta uh, and then later New Orleans, right? Uh, later uh, uh, than, than Houston and, and Atlanta. Um, it's because the Texas sport entrepreneur the Hoffines is the Bob Smiths, the people who congregate in the Edge Houston Sports Association that are the ones who, Craig Cullen and uh, bring the, the the franchise to Houston or, you know, the expansion franchise. They they understood exactly what Howard said. And earlier generations of entrepreneurs also figured this out. Those who were behind the Cotton Bowl in the 1940s, right? One of the first bowls in the South to actually allow black players to play in it when they when they allow Penn State to come with their black players in 1948. Um, uh, they realized that if they want to put Texas on the map, they want to put Houston on the map as a sports city that legalized and customary segregation as, had, as it had existed had to go. There was no way that a Willie Mays is going to, you know, for the Giants is going to stay in some segregated hotel somewhere in the night, early 1960s. And they knew that because they were paying attention to what was happening with the civil rights movement. And Houston is one of those epicenters of the sit-in movement, right, which starts in Greensboro, North Carolina, with black students in, in 1961. And you have black students in Texas Southern University in 1961, same period, doing the same sorts of things, doing sit-ins in downtown Houston. Right. Uh, you have even more moderate black leaders, you know, basically saying, look, you know, there's a new Houston here and we need to we need to have a Houston without segregation. So what happens in that context in the early 60s is this, this alliance with black leaders, including those of the younger ones in the student movement and the people in the Houston Sports Association who agree. Right. That uh, in order for the Ashton to be built, which needed to be passed with a 31 million dollar uh, uh, a bond a voting initiative in, in 1961. You know, Hoffines understood he needed black support, right? Yeah. Uh, and the Houston Sports Association makes clearly that there's no segregation that's going to happen in the Ashton, and it didn't. And that's one of the reasons why the Ashton was a beloved institution, right? Uh, not just because people like the Astros and the Oilers. And you know, Adams was a little slower on race than than the uh, Bud Adams said it, mm -hmm. the owner of mm -hmm. Oilers. But because it becomes this place where concerts happen, where the livestock rodeo happens, it is accessible to a wider demographic. So it is like it's you've really got UCLA, itself. Houston, and you've got UCLA, Houston, there Houston there college well. basketball concerts, rallies. You know, Selena fans in the 90s know that one of her famous concerts, you know, the Tahana music star happens in the Astrodome in 1995. You know, all of these monumental moments in Houston history happen in that building. Yeah, and Muhammad right. Ali fought in there too. Muhammad Ali boxes there in the late 60s, right? So, uh, yeah, and, and so that explains 
I think why, you know, so the Astrodome has its impact in terms of stadium construction design, but it also has its impact in Houston. And it really does accelerate, you know, a, a new day in Houston, a new desegregated Houston, not, not a Houston without racism, but one that certainly where you saw segregation embedded in the sporting culture, you know, wither away over time. And the Astrodome helps facilitate that transformation. Yeah. What were some of the choices that you had to make in terms of how much you were going to balance? You could have written two separate books here. You could have made this yeah. a, a, a two book volume if you wanted one on the arc of college sports and then one on yeah. the arc of pro sports. What were yeah. some of the to make that you had to make balance wise in terms of how much this was going to be a college book? Because you're talking about the Cotton Bowl. You're also talking yes. about the, the, the big schools. You're talking about Texas. You're talking about, you know, A&M and the rest of this. But now you also have the pros becoming a big part of professional sports in Texas. And then you also have the ABA in there as well. And we'll get into the Spurs in a minute, but we also have that piece of it too. So you had some serious choices you had to make in terms of what was going to get the attention of this book with one other thing as well, which I can tell because you're a sports fan, you also wanted to add play by play in there about some of the great moments in the game itself. So it was an interesting uh, undertaking for you. Yeah, I appreciate you highlighting these conundrums because they, they bedeviled me for the time, the time I was writing this book. I mean, the Ranger chapter came to me. I woke up one morning. Maybe you've had this experience. And I was like, wait a second. You know, I had a chapter outline and I was like, wait, I don't have a chapter on Major League Baseball. That can't work in this book. And, and I didn't pick the Astros because I was covering the Astros with the Dome. And to be honest with you, the Astros really aren't a story you know, until they get good in the late 70s, besides the Dome. You know, the Ashes of the Dome are synonymous until the late 70s when J.R. Richard and that and that team yeah. comes together, right? And J.R. Richard's an interesting figure we don't, I don't talk about actively in the book. So what links these two things together are two things. So certainly um, high school and college sports dominated in Texas throughout the first half of the 20th century, and certainly even in the post-World War II period. So the book starts right through with sporting cultures in the Jim Crow era. And that's the story of high school and, and college sports, because professional sports, you know, obviously you had things like the Texas League, semi-pro leagues for sure. But the heart and soul of Texas sports was at the high school and the collegiate level. I have questions for you, too, uh, Frank. One, uh, Anthony Head wants to know, did you cover any high school sports in the book? Yeah, only in the first chapter. You know, that's one of the things that dropped out. Um, you know, I talk about kind of the high school sports scene in, in Mission, Texas, and the Borderlands, because I'm trying to set up the story of Tom Landry, who comes out of this, you know, Mexican-American Borderlands society. People don't remember him that way. Um, I talk about a little bit, you know, El Paso. I don't talk about Texas Western, but, you know, I want people to have a sense of the predicament that Mexican-Americans face in the Jim Crow era as being, you know, legally white or discriminated against and exploited, right, as well, right? So it's in those moments when I talk about high school sports, and then it kind of falls away because, and this is going back to the initial question, I want to, I want us to understand how the business of sport drove so much of this. That's and right. And the business of sport drove, you know, not just the expansion of professional sports, but also the explosion of college sports in the 100%. second half of the 20th century. And that That's is a story. Right. That is a story of oil capital and finance money dumping, you know, being poured into these programs like the Texas Longhorns and the Southern Methodist University uh, Mustangs. And they are able to, you know, recruit players because of money, right? So this is a story, in some ways, of capital and labor, right? Uh, from the sporting, from the professional level to the collegiate level. I mean, obviously now you can drop that down to the youth level with, you know, the professionalization of youth sports. That's not something I well, talked about, but but very much what drives a lot of this is this combination of economic transformations and social transformations that are really, you know, really, you know, compelled by or impelled by the civil rights and the feminist movement. Indeed. Well, if I mangle this name, I apologize. So I don't know if it's Trennis Jones or Trenny Jones. So I'm going to use both. But question, how did Mr. Gary balance some of the benefits that Texas had in expanding sports throughout the U.S. and the world versus the negative cultural impacts Texas has had specifically in how yeah. African and women are treated? Yeah, that's a great question that flows from the point I just made. Uh, I, I do believe, and even though sometimes it's hard to, to hold on to this belief in 2020, 2021, that sport catalyzed significant social and cultural change in the United States. I do. Uh, and it certainly did in Texas, right? A society steeped in conquest, colonization, displacement of Native Americans, exploitation of Me Mexican and origin peoples, slavery and Jim Crow segregation, right? Uh, you know, the, the dynamic that I talked about happening in Houston is happening in other parts of the state, mostly in the big cities, but also in the smaller towns, 
Okay, so so I, I, there's no question that sport initiated a new society in Texas with respect to you know at the level of representation, at the level of who people you know, who people are who are playing on the athletic rosters. I mean, you cannot disregard the fact that spaces that have been utterly excluded and dominated by white men, college football, for example, or suddenly now you have black athletes and women athletes emerging on the stage in the 1970s. That's a significant social change. The problem with those social changes is that they will be better in a commercialized sport, right? Uh, and what we see happening, this is more towards the negative aspect, is that, you know, the sports revolution, right, is fueled by this, this by, by advertising dollars, fueled by television money, fueled by oral money, right? And it contributes to the growth of the sport management class the sport media class, which is almost overwhelmingly dominated by white men, right? So what you're seeing in this period is this kind of realignment of social hierarchies, right? So you have athletes coming, you know, athletes of color and women coming into these spaces that have been denied before. But then you've got, you just look at team photos from the 1970s and look at coaching staffs just grow. And yes. look how most of the time those are white guys, right? Uh, and so when Jackie Sherrill signs his historic contract, which I talk about in the conclusion of the book, when he's assigned by Texas a and when Bum Bright, who was the owner of the Cowboys, eventually, who's the booster who ushers in that deal for $1.6 million, and people are aghast, right, at that mm -hmm. salary, right? He just blows the roof off of coaches' salaries, and that helps us understand why Nick, uh, you know, Nick Saban gets paid $9 million a year. That's so right. the consequences of that is, the, is, is hyper-commodification. And, and, and I would argue a more exploitative sports culture now than what we had back then, I would say. Yeah, and also, don't forget uh, to buy your book, Partner Nowhere Bookshop. There is a buy the book link on the session, I think, to your right of your screen or somewhere on your screen. Just click on buy book. It is the sports revolution, how Texas changed the culture of American athletics. And I, I think that it's, it's great. I mean, I think that these questions are I'm hoping that what you're doing with this book is that you're giving some opportunity to other writers to begin to take on the movements in other states and yes. to really begin to create and pour that concrete, pour the foundation. Because when you think about Texas, obviously we've talked about to a lesser extent the growth of sports in California. When you look at Texas and California yes. in terms of yes. huge growth, um, th these places really do sort of inform and fuel some of the more national discussions that we've had before. Absolutely. And especially in Texas, and obviously we've talked about race and college football with Alabama, um, Ozzie Newsom, all of those things, but Texas is right there. Texas, it's, this, it's almost the same thing. Um, Tilda Wang, somebody who you may know, has a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Forgive me if you've covered this already, but can you talk about the role of gender in sports during this period in Texas? You talked about it a little bit with the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, but not yeah. um, in, you know, not to a huge extent. Yeah. So, yeah, one of the things I wanted this book to be is I didn't want it to be just a story about men in sports. You know, and I think, you know, and you have a lot of exceptions, but in general, I'll just speak in terms of the sport history, histories that I know. You know, we have stories of the black athlete. And then we have the stories of women athletes in sport. And they don't usually come into, unless you talk about black women. And even then, that's not much on that, by the way. Uh, they tend to be separate stories. So, you know, this follows with what Howard was saying earlier. I wanted this to be a story so that you understand that racial transformations are tied to economic transformations and are tied to gender transformations. Yes. And, you know, what we're seeing happening in this period, because sport is segregated by gender rigidly, Right. Even after the, the, the adoption of Title IX in 1972, right in this period, by the way, the same year that the Dallas Cowboy Cheers are created or professionalized, I should say, um, uh, is is, you know, you've got, the, you know, the movement to integrate on the racial level. And then you've got the feminist movement or, or, or feminist inspired sports activists, I should say, you know, coming right along with them. Right. Uh, and, and I would say to some degree that the, if you're going to look at the beneficiaries from that period, who benefited from the sports revolution? White rich men, sure. Yeah. Uh, supremely talented athletes, sure. The people who were the free agents in Major League Baseball. Some of them or a number of them black, yes. But that system is predicated on the exclusion of women or the peripheralization of women, right? So yeah. that's why I talk about the cheerleaders because they're part of the story. They're there. We just don't talk about them alongside the story of the integration of the NFL. Well, and that's also, mo you know, I was going to say, as we, not to interrupt, but you dig into yeah. that as well. You've got Title IX coming in there in 72 yeah. as well. And yet 
it it gets treated more as charity and not an opportunity for commercialization. That's it. Well, and that's and that's why that's why I do the tennis chapter because nowhere can you see the marriage between capitalism <laughs> and feminism any better than in the creation of the women's professional tennis tour. You've got Billie Jean King, you've got Nancy Ritchie, the Texas, you know, San Angelo tennis star, Lord Rosie Casale, the original nine. Yeah. You know, agitate for equal pay. Right. You've got Gladys Hellman trying to knock on the door or beat down the door of the male tennis establishment saying, hey, you know, women players are not getting paid equally. And they're like, well, the hell with you. We don't care. Nobody cares about women in sport. The people that still, they don't nobody will watch uh, women tennis. Yeah. And it is this it is Philip Morris tobacco money with Joe Coleman, who is a tennis enthusiast, uh, you know, who finances this tour, that, which becomes a WTA, which is this massive commercial, uh, you know, monster that we know now that we associate with Naomi Osaka and the Williams sisters, et cetera, right? So, um, so that, you know, and but that's a feminist inspired insurgency, you know, and it starts in a locker room at the West Side Tennis Club in Forest Hills, which that's something beautiful about that story, just well, weeks after nice. the Women's March for Equality in 1970, right? So, you know, to me, that's part of the story of, the ways in which capitalism allowed for opportunities, right, and, and how people were pushed for opportunities. And, and this is the heyday, really, of, of, in terms of athlete labor. Major League Baseball is getting things. NBA players are getting things. Even NFL players are getting things going on strike. And the and women's Kurt Flood is taken under the Supreme Court. To the Kurt Flood, absolutely. So the yeah. women's movement in tennis is precisely part of the same story, as far as I'm concerned. Well, no question. Carrie Klein has a question. I recently moved from New York City to San Antonio. I'm curious how living and working in Texas informed your understanding of this yeah. larger topic and how being out of Texas might help you see it from new perspectives. That is an outstanding question. So I taught at the University of Texas, Austin, for 11 years. Um, uh, you know, I have family in San Antonio, my in-laws in San Antonio, um, who have been in San Antonio since 1731. Wow. So I had this book would have never been written if I hadn't lived in Texas and saw a sides of Texas that were not apparent to the outsider. Right. That's why this is a book that certainly I talk about a lot of the legendary white Texas athletes in this book, the dope walkers and the, and the legendary figures like Lamar Hunt and those kinds of people. But I do want people to see what I saw when I lived in Austin, which is a, a, a society that was also shaped by the freedom movements of the 60s and 70s, a society that is as part of Mexico as a part of the United States, a society where black folks, you know, had robust sporting cultures that you see in the Jim Crow era. And I learned about doing public history work when I was at the University of Texas, Austin, and that you see in places like the Fondy Rec Center in Houston, which becomes this, you know, the analogous um, scene, pickup basketball scene that we associate with Rucker Park in Harlem, right? I want, I want Texans to remember that story, which they probably know already, but I want the outsiders like up here in, in provincial New York City <laughs> who think that Texas is just a Republican state of a bunch of conservative backward people to see that this is a society that was dynamic and had a gigantic role in our understanding of sport in our society. So, and I only understood that by living there, right? Uh, and and really looking past a lot of the kinds of images that many people, from, that the people who read the New York Times would see. I don't see that represented in the national press, right? And I try to highlight that tension even in the book, you know, in the ways in which the national sports media could not understand what they were seeing in San Antonio when the Spurs became successful in the 1970s, right? That's so, a good way to jump in, yeah. right? We are yeah. got about yeah. 10 minutes left, and I wanted to ask you about San Antonio yes. specifically. Yes. And this battle, so we're talking about this revolution, and part of this revolution is competition. Yes. And so in <laughs> that competition, you've got the NBA and the ABA. And the, the role of the Spurs pre-merger is very different from what happens post-merger. Yeah. And that's a very interesting arc that you get into as well. Yeah, and I leaned heavily on the classic book, which you probably know, Howard, um, at least of parts of the chapter on the Spurs, uh, Terry Pluto's Loose Balls, which is an oral, ball, sure. oral history of the ABA, which is a wonderful book. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I had to write about the Spurs. You know, I came to, to Texas as a Laker fan, and I left as a Spurs fan. I probably shouldn't say that publicly. Uh, What's that? Uh, I see it. I see something in your shirt there. Yeah, I have. See, I have. I have. I have the. I have the. The authentic, uh, so-called uh, authentic uh, representation of Spurs fandom, because, and I now see what makes the Spur phenomena that we associate with Greg Popovich and the legends of the of of of, of the you know, Tim Duncan, etc. What made it work is what because of the way the franchise was founded in the early 70s, an ABA franchise. Uh, yep. You know, that was 
borrow from Dallas. It's a, it's a great story. I won't get into the whole story, but you know, they, it, it, ABA basketball was failing in Dallas miserably. Uh, it arrives in San Antonio. People think this is a mistake. This is a sleepy city. This is a poor city. This is a tourist working class city. You know, this pro basketball can't work. It's not working in Houston very well. It's not working in Dallas. And it worked in San Antonio. And it worked in San Antonio because the ABA was a fledgling league that was trying to make it and was willing to do whatever it took to get fans into the stands. And that's what that's what the Spurs do when they create the, the baseline bums band, uh, uh, a fan club in 1974. Uh, uh, so tickets are cheap, right? And then talent is abundant. It is abundant. You know, like uh, Angelo Drosso is the president of the uh, of the uh, organization, brings George Gervin and a host of other talented players like Larry Keenan and um, and and James Silas and others, and they quickly become phenomenal, phenomenally successful, and they become a hit in San Antonio. And they become a hit because they allowed spaces, unlike the Cowboys and these other franchises, you know, for the for the Mexican origin majority to to show up at the arena. And you know, you walk it into like the an 18th, Oakland Raiders fan base as well. It's too. you know, it's similar, a lot, a little less menacing than the Raiders, fan. <laughs> <laughs> but similar to yes, the, to, to the Rasa's presence among Raider fans. That it's it's analogous. But the Spurs, you know, like what we associate with Los Spurs marketing now, you know, that's mm -hmm. concocted by you know Madison Avenue types. This is a grassroots kind of marketing campaign that makes that makes the franchise successful. So that when yes. Sebastian de la Cruz, who sings the national anthem at the 2013 NBA Finals. And you know, when racists come after him because they couldn't fathom how could a guy, how could a kid in a mariachi uh, outfit sing the national anthem? And Spurs fans, even the franchise are like, no, this is this is our city. This, this is, is who we are. Yeah. You know? That's a great example as well as to the, every story that we tell, it's always about choices. It's always about the decisions yes, and not just yes. the, the choices that we make as the writers, but the decisions that these, that the subjects make, yes. they could have easily said, as we think back uh, to where we are right now, you go think back to some of the decisions that people make or the, the, these team owners make about who's an American and about what our fan base is gonna be and what we want it to look like and, and how different it can be if you lean into to one context and then you lean away from another. And I think that that's one of the things that I really took from this first chapter that I really liked was we always talk about fans in a very generic sense that they're, the white male talk radio yeah. thing. And that's not what this was. This was a no. totally different flavor. And, and and also we talk about the homogenization as well of both sports from a marketing standpoint and of how we portray the different elements of sports. So you knew when you went to San Antonio, you were getting a totally different flavor from the sports fan, from the environment, from the team, the whole thing, it was a different place. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And I'm so glad you highlighted choices. You know, as a historian, this matters to me, you know, because I think, you know, it's very easy for us to say that things happen because, you know, economic forces or political forces or these kind of faceless, nameless forces make history happen. I was trained by a social historian, right, who understood or by social historians who understood that history happens because people make choices. Right. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Hayden Fry decided I'm going to be a white coach who's going to sign a black player when he didn't have to, because Daryl Royal didn't do it at the same time. It took him a lot longer to make that decision. You know, um, the first for the second Spurs coach, Bass, Bob Bass, you know, uh, another figure who was like, OK, we're going to remake the Spurs into this running gun franchise as team that's going to foreground the talents of our black players. That was a choice he made. Right. Uh, so choices matter. Entrepreneurs were far-sighted, but they made certain decisions, right? Activists make certain decisions, right? And that's what drives history as far as and I'm concerned. And cities make different decisions. Once again, when and we talk cities about- cities, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah, the no, that, that's, that's, that's central to, yeah, that's central to my, to the story, you know, and, and, and partly because I'm trying to empower people now, like we can make choices. <laughs> we don't that's have to right. accept what we have because that's, that's how things, that's how things change. Yeah, I think one of the great powers of this, of this book is it does center Texas in a way that I don't think, Texas has been centered in terms of the, the ongoing story, which is sort of odd in some ways because there's so much money there and we've always followed money. And there are so many people, whether you're talking about a, a, a Jerry Jones or you're talking about a Tech Schramm or you're talking about, about any of these figures that, uh, or even you go back to Guy Lewis, there, there are all yes. of these different figures that are across the, uh, across the landscape and to bring that all into one place is really, um, is really useful. It's a, and it's really, really well done. Um, I had another just one sort of writing question for you mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. which was when you are 
I always say, and people say this to me all the time, you're never done with a book, you just surrender. What didn't make the book? What, oh. where, did you, where did you wanna go that you didn't get a chance to go? Yeah. Simply because when it's time to hand it in, it's just time to hand it in. Yeah. So, you know, this book was shaped by the fact that I left Texas. So uh, when I agreed, when I signed the contract to do it, I, I never thought I was going to leave Texas. I had, a, I had a two year old daughter. My earlier work was on Cuban history. And I thought, oh, this would be easy for me to do because <laughs> I could just take a drive over here and fly. A short flight. <laughs> then I left and I came back to New York and I think that was the right decision. It was. Um, so that shaped, you know, my original thought was I was going to have a lot more stuff on grassroots sports, you know, like grassroots soccer. My brother-in-law is a soccer coach in San Antonio. I wanted to say something about soccer in this book. It didn't happen. Um, I wanted to say something about the Friday Night Lights phenomenon, partly because the show was shot in Austin when I was living there. I was an extra mm -hmm. on a show just for kids. Uh, you know, Friday Night Lights has a huge impact on understanding of Texas sports. That didn't make it. I wanted to write about Bum Phillips and, and, the, and the Love You Blue Oilers of the 70s. I think they're a really mm -hmm. interesting group. Yeah, Pastor really Reed, are. Earl Campbell. Earl Campbell. Billy and White Bum Shoes Phillips, Johnson Oilers. White yeah. Shoes Johnson, Robert Brazil, and, and that Love You Blue era in, in, in Houston. I mean, that's Houston sport at its best as far as I'm concerned. You know, I mean, the and Rockets also, have their – And also, as we talk about the Dallas Cowboys, let's not forget that Houston Oilers song, you know, that people – like yeah. I grew up in Boston, yeah. and we remember yeah. the Oilers. We remember yeah. the you know, the Houston Oilers number one song and the whole thing, that there are different pieces of the story that become national. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I say in the book. I mean, this book, you could argue, started written, being written when I was seven years old, watching the Oilers-Dolphins game in 1978 in my apartment in Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the things like that, you know, Texas Western didn't show up in the book. You know, the very famous story that the team that wins the nat national championship was all black starting five. You know, I get that question a lot. And I didn't deal with it because I, I felt like it was kind of addressed already. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, that got left out, you know, among other things. There were a lot of things I had to leave out. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, that's what we do as writers. We have to make choices. Uh, go back yeah, to well, making choices. Some, exactly. And sometimes, sometimes you also feel like some of these big, these big subjects, it's almost like writing about Lincoln, right? Or yeah. Jackie oh, Robinson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What can I add new to this? Can I add yes. something new to this? And does it need my voice? Do I have to go over it just because everyone's gone over it? That's Maybe right. there's a you're doing more of a service to unearth other things and to give your yes. energy, your energy and attention to that. And I'm invested in unearthing other things. I'm a historian by training, and part of what we do as historians is, is to try to tell you something about the past that you didn't know before, right? To try to bring right. new evidence to light that you know had not been had not been consulted to recontextualize figures that we know about. And that, you know, this book is trying to do both. It's trying to kind of bring in a new set of evidence and it's trying to reposition a Billie Jean King, a Hakeem Olajuwon, a George Gervin, stories that we know in these team or league histories. It's through a story of, of, a, of a dynamic place and a given, in a, in a, you know, an interesting, fascinating historical moment. No, indeed. Indeed. Well, I'm rolling through. We are almost out of time. The book is The Sports Revolution, How Texas Change the Culture of American Athletics. The writer is, of course, Frank Gerdy. And I pronounced you wrong. It's Gerdy, isn't it? Uh, Gerdy's fine. Yes, Gerdy. It yeah. is, right? You've got to put, yes. a, you, you've, you've got to put the accent over the eye. I know. But my father doesn't. So, you know, that's a, that, that, that's a research project I need to take up. Where's my name come from? <laughs> it's from so the Dominican Republic. But, you know, beyond that, you know, there's a lot of silent uh, history in my family that I haven't figured out to uncover yet. <laughs> no, well, I, I'm grateful for this. I'm happy it's on my bookshelf, and I'm really happy that we get a chance to do this. Once again, if you'd like to buy the book, please hit buy book um, on your screen. And thank you for the San Antonio uh, Book Festival 2021. Once again, uh, I'm Howard Bryant. This has been just uh, one of my favorite things to do. I love talking books, and I certainly love talking to you. And um, one other thing as well is that um, – at the end of these pro at, the, at the end of these projects, do you take a nap or do you say what's next? I, I'm not somebody to take naps. Uh, my wife uh, tells me I need to take a nap once in a while. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm really interested. I'm not done with stadiums, so my next book yeah. is about stadiums in America uh, because I dealt with some questions in this book, but there's some more things I want to talk about. Stadiums as sites of community community formation, but also sites of conflict, which we've seen over the last year. There's a long history to tell about that. And so that's that's my next thing. I'm already kind of thinking about that. Indeed. Um, and, on, and exactly. Yeah. And on top of that, you get the fact that these stadiums, people don't seem to believe it, but they belong to us. This is your they taxpayer. Do. 
That's your exactly taxpayer right. dollar is at work. And so there's a wonderful battle there that has taken place. And I think people have surrendered it a little bit. But I think we're starting to see more now over the last couple of years or so that yes. there's a bit of a recorrection here in terms of people trying to reclaim a little bit of ownership over uh, these massive stadium deals and who gets to pay for them and who, uh, you know, who has the power here. That's the story that I'm trying to tell my next book. That's exactly right. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank and, you all. Uh, thank you, Howard. Thank you. We're looking forward to uh, seeing everyone again, maybe at the San Antonio Book Fest in person, which I would like very, very much. So would I. Next year, we'll have to do your book. Indeed. Signing off. Thank you very much, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. See you, Frank. Take care. Thank you.